The National Conference for Nurse Practitioners, the NCNP, if you're a nurse practitioner, you need to be here. It's put together by NPs for NPs. The faculty are expert clinicians with years of experience. It's our opportunity to continue and further our education from injections to fish hook removal to um, draining abscesses. So it's a really great evidence-based, hands-on conference. In this episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast, Dr. Jana Esden discusses adverse childhood experiences. How did you become interested in adverse childhood experiences? Well, I work for a community health center in Northeast Wisconsin. In early 2016, our leadership arranged for a presentation on ACEs, and this was for our entire organization. Uh, We had someone come, she was the executive director of an organization that was local to our area, and their mission is sort of to engage community stakeholders and improve mental health care in the area. So she did a description of ACEs, what what adverse childhood experiences were and what the negative health outcomes um, that were associated with ACEs. And then she sort of touched a little bit on trauma-informed care. And I think her goal was to basically spread the word about the issue and make providers aware that childhood trauma can affect people as adults. And for me, it was like mission accomplished. My eyes were like bug-eyed the entire time during the presentation. It really lit a fire under me. I didn't understand why I didn't know about this already and it completely changed my perspective and how I care for patients. Um, I work with a very special population. Uh, Between 40 and 50 percent of our patient population have a history of four or more ACEs, which is kind of like the point where it really becomes a problem for people. And it sort of changed the way that I, it changed the way I cared for them, um, and I started publishing and presenting on the topic. I just became so interested in it um, that I started doing that and implementing information on it in a course that I teach for family nurse practitioner students. But I would say the most important thing that I did differently was I, I started implementing trauma-informed care as I cared for my patients at the community health center. What are the different types of adverse childhood experiences? Well, originally there were seven. So in the first wave of the original ACE study, so there was this study done in the 1990s. It was on a huge population of individuals in Southern California. And for that first wave of that original study, uh, they, there were seven adverse childhood experiences. And those included uh, verbal abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse, as well as violence against a mother, uh, living with someone with a substance use disorder, such as uh, uh, someone who was an alcoholic or used illicit drugs, uh, living with someone who was mentally ill, or living with someone who had been to prison. In the second wave of that study, they added physical and emotional neglect. And later on, in subsequent studies, they added parental separation or divorce. So now there is a total of 10 uh, different adverse childhood experiences. Can you tell us a little bit about the original ACE study? Yes. Even though this is a really old study at this point, it's still such a landmark study that we still talk about it. Um, One of the lead researchers of the study, Dr. Vincent Felitti, uh, he was working with Kaiser Permanente in an obesity clinic in the 1980s. And his weight loss program was working very well for people. However, he noticed that a lot of his participants were randomly just dropping out of the program and rapidly regaining their lost weight. So in an effort to figure out why this was happening, he interviewed them. And during the interviews, he accidentally stumbled upon a history of child sexual abuse while he was interviewing one patient. And then he had another patient mention child sexual abuse as well. So at that point, he started routinely asking about childhood sexual abuse and found that over 50% of his patients, so that was like in a sample size of 300 patients, over 50% of them had a history of child sexual abuse. So this caused him to wonder if other types of abuse and and child sexual abuse in childhood could potentially be linked to other medical problems other than obesity. So he teamed up with the CDC and they did a very large study with 17,000 participants in Southern California. Now this is a very specific population. These were uh, people who worked for, they had Kaiser uh, health plans. So these were full-time working adults with health benefits and all that. But these participants completed confidential surveys about their childhood experiences. Uh, They also answered questions about their current health status and their current health behaviors. They had physicals, they had lab work done. Basically, the important findings that came out of this study were, number one, the prevalence of ACEs, and number two, that ACEs were linked to mental illness, health risk behaviors, and chronic illness in sort of a stepwise increase. We call it a dose-response relationship between 
if, if a person experienced only one adverse childhood experience um, as a kid, they had you know maybe a small increased risk for something like alcohol use disorder. But then as their number of ACEs increased, just like steps, so did their risk for a lot of different behavioral stuff like alcohol use disorder, other illicit substances, uh, abusing those, also mental illnesses and, and chronic illnesses such as liver disease, uh, COPD, and things like that. So regarding the prevalence, they found that over 60% of their participants had reported at least one ACE, and 12.5% of that population reported four or more ACEs. So this really shocked the investigators. Um, physical abuse was found to be most commonly reported at 28.3%, and that was followed by household substance use at 26.9%. Now, another important note uh, that kind of shocked me when I reviewed the original study was that nearly one in four women reported child sexual abuse. And this is in a sample size of over 9,000 women. So over the last 20 years, um, you might be wondering if this can be replicated. And the answer is yes, it's been replicated over and over again in different parts of the country with very large study populations, you know, 54,000, 48,000. And in all of these studies, close to 60% of people reported at least one ACE and somewhere between 13 and 15% of people reported four or more ACEs. And that number, particularly that four or more, is important because the original study as well as subsequent studies studies have discovered, you know, that dose response relationship. And once you hit four, it really um, starts to cause a lot of uh, lifetime of uh, negative and adverse effects. So for example, um, compared to participants with no childhood trauma, those with four or more ACEs were for example, seven times more likely to abuse alcohol, uh, 10 times more likely to have injected IV drugs, and 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. So the same stepwise increase was also seen with chronic illnesses uh, such as heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, like I mentioned, and even cancer. So this has been confirmed with additional studies as well, These the stepwise increase with uh, different conditions. And actually, they've linked more than 40 health outcomes to ACEs in that dose-dependent relationship. How do ACEs affect brain development in children? In kids who have a significant history of childhood trauma, toxic stress alters their brain development. So transient stress and toxic stress are two different things. Transient stress is a normal part of growing up, and it's not harmful because it's intermittent, and usually the effects of it are mitigated by a supportive caregiver who's there for the child, reliable, responding to the child's needs. But toxic stress, on the other hand, is a prolonged activation of the body's stress response system. This occurs in the absence of a supportive caregiver. Nobody's there to um, respond to the child's needs and make things better. And this occurs, um, like I said, in the absence of that supportive caregiver, and it also may occur during sensitive developmental stages for the brain. And this leads to disruption in brain development. So there's things that like access cat catecholamines, there's cortisol that's high and shouldn't be, and there's other pro-inflammatory uh, substances that damage the brain and actually change the architecture of the brain. So these changes negatively impact uh, the child's future learning behavior and health their functioning is impacted. So there's different areas of the brain that are impacted and, and end up affecting things like attention span, reasoning, even things like impulse control and memory. Uh, problem solving is another example. They also experience uh, increased hypervigilance and they have heightened fear responses as well. And all of this stuff can impair learning and, and they have a reduced ability to regulate mood. How do ACEs impact the health of adults? Well, ACEs negatively impact adult health through three different mechanisms. Uh, one of them is increasing risk for mental illness. Another one is by aiding in the development of adverse coping behaviors. And the third one is by altering the body function of body systems like the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the immune system. So. For example, with, with the increase in mental illness, there is a significantly elevated risk for anxiety depression in people who have significant childhood trauma. Uh, depression tends to be more severe, uh, earlier onset, harder to treat, for example. ACEs are also linked to various mental illnesses, and child sexual abuse has the most association with a variety of mental illnesses compared to other types of abuse and neglect, with physical abuse being a close second. With regards to the adverse coping behaviors, this is where 
where there's a paradox. I mean, behaviors that a healthcare provider would see as a problem are viewed by the patient as being a solution. For example, if uh, Dr. Felitti, I heard him speak one time in person, and he talked about how with the weight loss and the women leaving the weight loss program and gaining back the weight, they recognized that when they lost weight, men paid more attention to them. So th that made them feel anxious and unsafe. So they literally overate and put the weight back on because it made them feel safer. So, you know, when we are seeing patients in the clinical setting, we have to realize that even though we don't want our patients to be overweight because it, we know it increases their risk for certain health conditions, we have to recognize that that could be the patient's solution to their problem, even though we view it as being the problem. So uh, other examples include using substances like alcohol and nicotine to help with anxiety. And then these behaviors increase their risk for diseases like cardiovascular disease, COPD, and liver disease. Um, Lastly, this prolonged exposure to toxic stress doesn't just, just alter brain development. It also is associated with other body system dysfunction. So toxic stress, for example, can lead to a pro-inflammatory state in the body, and this leads to the development of diseases independent of those health risk behaviors. I mean, there was a study done on kids with significant childhood trauma, and they had coronary artery disease already in, when they were 16, 17, 18 years old. And they've also done studies on people adults who have a history of significant childhood trauma, and they still have elevated levels of pro-inflammatory substances in their body, you know, years later, decades later, showing that, that this response it has a long-term effect. And in the end, uh, individuals with six or more ACEs on average die 20 years earlier than people who have no history of childhood trauma due to a combination of these factors. What is trauma-informed care, and what does it mean when someone says that a healthcare organization is trauma-informed? Well, trauma-informed care is a complete paradigm shift for how we provide care to our patients. It's a complete change of perspective. Instead of thinking what's wrong with you, we think what's happened to you instead. So there's a difference between a provider using a trauma-informed approach versus an entire organization being trauma-informed. Even my entire organization is not trauma-informed, but I provide trauma-informed care every day. Um, a trauma-informed organization changes more than just clinical interventions. This is a whole mentality that's, that's embedded in the culture, the beliefs, the attitudes of the organization. It's not how we treat patients. It's not just how we treat patients. It's also how we treat each other. Um, a trauma-informed organization realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands that patients and families can heal and recover from trauma. So these organizations are able to recognize symptoms of trauma, not just in their patients, but also in their staff. And they're able to respond by fully integrating this knowledge about trauma into all of their policies and procedures and practices um, in, in this organization. Um, a trauma-informed approach can still facilitate healing in patients and families, and a trauma-informed care provider uh, addresses the consequences of trauma instead of just treating the symptoms of it. So, so you can do that even if your whole organization hasn't undergone a lot of education and training in trauma-informed care. So we know that, well, trauma-informed providers know that um, patients may have this history. We can recognize it. Uh, we can uh, treat them by and still avoid re-traumatizing them as we're treating them. For example, sensitive exams or procedures that we know might re-traumatize a patient. Um, and we just, we know that they have unique health challenges and we make adaptations to our usual care routines uh, to build trust and to avoid that re-traumatization risk. What are some of the barriers to becoming a trauma-informed organization? Well, barriers to an organization being trauma-informed can be related to cost or time constraints, but really it comes down to that cultural shift. It, it, that needs to occur, and for that to occur, uh, organizational leadership needs to be committed uh, to that change. And if they're not on board, it, it's never going to happen. I mean, there needs to be systematic education of staff, and then they need to have ongoing education because we know that there's a lot of turnover and so new people are coming in and if they didn't have that original training they need to be trained and then everyone else sort of needs continuing education to make sure that they don't forget about you know this new perspective uh, the paradigm shift affects policies and procedures so all this stuff needs to be rewritten and everyone's practice is adjusted so it's not always easy and if there's not buy-in from other providers and staff this can be another barrier to implementing trauma-informed care what are the four E's of trauma-informed care? 
The four E's is a model of trauma-informed care for nurses to use in correctional facilities. And this was developed by two nurses, Dr. Elizabeth Mollard and Dr. Diane Bragg Hudson. Uh, they recognized that incarcerated women are very vulnerable and they have a high prevalence of ACEs, uh, particularly physical and sexual violence in their past, and they also have a, an increased prevalence of mental illness. So they stressed the importance of using a trauma-informed correctional environment approach, and they developed these four E's, uh, educate, empathize, explain, and empower as a model of providing trauma-informed care for this patient population. And this model can be adapted for the primary care setting as well. How can nurse practitioners use the four E's in their practice settings? The first E stands for educate. Yes, uh, well educate stands for basically the systematic education of all providers and staff in the organization. So this is formal education on ACEs, the prevalence, how it affects brain development, how ACEs alter body function and contribute to the development of mental illness and chronic illness, all that stuff. And then also this training would include information on trauma-informed care, on how to recognize trauma in patients and families, how to respond to disclosures of abuse, and how to intervene to help patients in need. The second E is for empathy. Yes, this one is, is super important. This is where we gain a deeper understanding of our patients. We consider and ask about how trauma has affected them as people. So we need to develop sensitive responses to abuse disclosures. And a lot of people need to practice these in advance because sometimes in the moment, um, if you're hearing something particularly disturbing, it's really hard to um, sort of manage your facial expression and body language. So it is good to practice those things in advance. Um, literature suggests that people are not offended or triggered when asked about childhood trauma as long as they don't receive a negative response to their disclosure. So that is so important. Um, this is also where, using the E, you know, the empathy, uh, this is where we recognize patients' potential barriers to following a recommended treatment plans. Um, we consider whether issues such as financial or transportation um, problems are causing a barrier, uh, but also we think about deeper issues that can set our patients up for failure when it comes to a plan of care. For example, we talked about um, the woman with a history of child sexual abuse. If she is overeating because it reduces her anxiety and makes her feel more safe, we cannot simply tell her to reduce her calories and increase her exercise. That's not going to do anything. The same thing for a patient who's abusing alcohol to reduce uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. We can't just tell the patient to quit drinking. We need a comprehensive plan of care to treat the underlying cause of the alcohol use disorder. The third E is explain. The main goal with this element is to provide a safe environment for patients so they feel comfortable returning for visits in the future. So the nurse practitioner using a trauma-informed approach will discuss with patients why certain exams or procedures are important and explain in detail what to expect. And also being transparent and understanding and explaining that the procedure may be triggering to the patient. And it's interesting because if you think it's going to be triggering to the patient, you really need to discuss that openly because the patient doesn't need you to tell them that it's going to be triggering. They already know the procedure is going to be triggering. But what that does do is build trust with the patient that you're being transparent about the procedure because a fear of re-traumatization can contribute to why patients don't return for procedures. That patient who's uh, canceled a PAP appointment seven times in a row. I mean, that should be a red flag to us to uh, call the patient and ask if there are any questions about the procedure. Um, dental visits as well. People who, with a child, a history of child sexual abuse, going to a dentist visit is not the same as for someone who doesn't have that history. Them being asked to lay back, open their mouth for a long period of time, have a heavy weight on their chest. I mean, this can be very triggering for patients. So we need to make sure that we're being transparent, answering questions, and most importantly, adjusting our routines to accommodate the unique needs of our patients. I mean, we're used to doing things a certain way, but we don't have to do them that way. For example, we can offer self-insertion of the speculum during a pelvic exam, which may really help to reduce um, the traumatizing nature of that sensitive exam for a patient with a history of child sexual abuse, for example. And the fourth E is empower. Yes, this one is really important too. Well, it's hard for me to choose the most important one, but um, this is where nurse practitioners empower individuals to improve their own health. So as if we're using a trauma-informed approach, we're recognizing that there is a power differential between patient and provider, and we actively seek to remove that barrier and to empower patients. So 
Trauma-informed care is strength-based. And as the nurse practitioner, I'm just facilitating goal setting for my patient. They're actively involved in the healthcare decisions and choices. So I don't advise patients of what they need, but instead I educate them on what services are available to them. And then they're encouraged to make their own decisions regarding their healthcare. For example, offering a patient a cancer screening test and explaining why the test is helpful as opposed to just simply saying it's time for a mammogram and placing the order without even really consulting the patient or even asking them if they want the test done. I mean, the trauma-informed care part is the explaining and offering part. <laughs> so part of empowering also includes advocating for them. So part of this is recognizing that trauma has impacted their life and ensuring that we're considering underlying causes for their symptoms and treating them in an evidence-based manner. But we're also working to connect our patients to care and resources. How do you implement trauma-informed care in your clinical setting? Well, I work in a really unique setting, and I work in a very small satellite clinic that's part of a community health center, and this satellite clinic is in a transitional housing complex for men transitioning out of homelessness. Um, I also see homeless men and women from a local warming shelter, and I see men transitioning out of jail and prison as well. Um, our little tiny satellite clinic, I would say, is trauma-informed. However, our main clinic doesn't use the same strategies we do. So at, at my clinical visit, I definitely use the four E's in my clinical approach, uh, with the main thought process being that we're recognizing that trauma has impacted our patients' lives. Like I said, between 40 and 50 percent of my patients have an ACE score of four or more, so it's more prevalent there. And we're simply the facilitator of goal setting for the patient. Uh, we're building trust with them. We're using shared decision-making strategies. Um, it, it, when they come in as a new patient, they do complete an ACE screener, and that's immediately followed by a conversation with me. Um, we talk about how trauma has affected them, and then we start to develop that plan of care. Uh, we also have a healthcare advocate at our tiny site, and she does outreach visits at our local homeless shelters and other local organizations. We have what we call a HICU form. It's a health insurance checkup form. This is really a patient-centered screening tool. Uh, it asks patients if they need help with insurance, if they would like a primary care provider, if they have dental or behavioral health concerns that they would like addressed. So we use that as we're bringing in new patients into our clinic. Uh, we also do personal reminder calls for patients, and this includes calling the patient's case manager or the shelter they're staying if they don't have a phone. We also do a lot of assisting patients with transportation uh, to and from appointments. We have extra long appointment time so that we can help them with scheduling appointments for dental, hospital procedures, and other specialty visits. And additionally, and this is a real asset, we have an on-site behavioral health specialist, and she can a lot of times see patients the same day, so this resource has really been helpful for us as well. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be taken as such, and does not replace professional judgment or advice. The ideas and viewpoints expressed in this podcast do not reflect the official position of the speakers, authors, affiliated organizations, the Nurse Practitioner Journal, or Walters Kluwer.